Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin, and a couple of comments before we get started. Um, SC is coming up in November, and I will be there. Um, I won't be at a booth. I'll be walking around. Um, I'll be tweeting while I'm there, and my Twitter name is B-R-O-C-K-P-A-L-E-N, Brock Palin. And you can find that on the RCE website if you want at rce-cast.com. Also, again, Jeff is helping me out, and I believe Jeff will be there also. Jeff, what will you be doing at SC? Yeah. Yes, I'll be there. I'll have my usual open MPI buff where we're going to talk about uh, State of the Union, where we've been, where we are, where we're going with my uh, co-host of uh, George Basilica from uh, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And I'll probably be spending quite a bit of time in the Cisco booth, too. I think we're uh, number 1847. Um, somewhere in the middle of the floor there somewhere. But so uh, please, people, drop by and say hello. Okay, yeah, I know that boff. I'm at that pretty much every year, and that's actually where we originally met. And I yes, always learn something new that you guys did every year that I come back and <laughs> use pretty heavily. So. Cool. Well, I don't know if I'll be tweeting from the show or not. I do have a Twitter account. It's Jay Squires. Uh, but uh, random little fact, I actually got that for API testing purposes, not really for tweeting purposes. <laughs> and uh, a bunch of people started following me, and so I kind of figured, like, okay, guess I really should do something professional with this account. So every once in a great while, I tweet on there, and maybe I'll do something during SC, but it's more likely I'll put some uh, some stuff on my blog while I'm there. Okay. Okay. But our show for today is Silo. It's a file um, data storage format. Um I've never used it. I learned about it from the Visit guys when we had them on the show. And we have with us Mark Miller from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And we can get Mark to introduce himself and give us a little bit of background on what Silo is and his own background. That'd be great. Mark, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Brock, and thanks, Jeff. Um, yes, uh, Silo is, a, is basically an I.O. library in scientific database Um it's uh, primarily an, uh, an, an interface for reading and writing scientific data in terms of uh, meshes, the uh, you know typical finite element, finite different types of meshes that we deal with, and then variables defined on those meshes, uh, piecewise linear, piecewise constant, or in uh, other terminology, uh, zone-centered and node-centered variables on those meshes. And development of Silo started at Livermore Labs probably in the early 90s, I think. The earliest C code in the Silo source code, I think, is around 92. And uh, it's been uh, developed by a number of different developers over time. Um, many of them are on the visit team also. And it's been enhanced. And more recently, I've become responsible for uh, maintenance and enhancements of Silo in the past few years. Okay, so what is your own personal background? Have you been doing file formats before, been working at HPC for a long time, sysadmin, programmer, user? What's your own, uh, how do you get started in this? Right. Uh, well, actually, when I first started at Livermore Labs about 18 years ago, uh, one of my first responsibilities was to uh, sort of redesign the underlying one of the underlying I.O. drivers in Silo. Well, not so much redesign it, but, um, but reconfigure it. Uh, we were at at the time we were using a library called PDB. That's not to be confused with Protein Database. It's a portable database written by Stuart Brown at Lawrence Livermore Labs. And at the time, uh, we were trying to find a way to um, to restructure the way we were using PDB in Silo. And so one of my first jobs at Livermore Labs was to do that. And I did a very large analysis of uh, the I/O performance of Silo at the time including, you know, for example, at the silo interface, if you issue a call to write a mesh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the question is how many real I.O. requests does that result to on an actual file on disk? And uh, after reconfiguring the way we were using the underlying libraries a bit, we were able to reduce what I called I.O. fragmentation at the time. You know, one call from the client ends up looking, could end up looking like hundreds of I.O. calls on disk, and uh, we were trying to reduce the amount of fragmentation that was occurring. And... Uh, from then on, I have I have worked on you know worked with things like MPI I/O. I went I was really heavily into scalable I/O in the late late 90s. Then I worked on some other scientific database software called uh, Safe as part of the um, Accelerated Strategic Computing Initiative. And uh, from there, I've been working on on Visit primarily, but 75% uh, of my time is on Visit. About 25% of my time right now is on Silo. 
So what was Silo? It was a replacement for PDB, but what was the target for PDB and Silo? Like, is it for a specific project at Lawrence Livermore, or was it supposed to encompass all your data so you had one format for everybody working there? Right. Um, so when I started at Livermore Labs, we were uh, in, I, I work in B division, and there's two divisions at the lab that, that have traditionally um, – uh, tried to share software and run into a number of difficulties in doing that. And one of the one of the ways to achieve sharing of software is to make sure everybody writes their data to basically the same data format. And for many years at Livermore Labs, that that didn't even happen within one uh, one division. Different code groups would choose different um, I/O formats, and there are a variety of reasons for why this would happen. But uh, ultimately, Silo was designed so that, for example, within B Division at Livermore Labs, all the codes could read and write their, um, their data to a common format and then share tools that use that format. Uh, so that was the reason that Silo was uh, designed. And you had mentioned PDB. PDB is not sort of designed as a replace. Or, or Silo wasn't designed as a replacement for PDB. It was designed as a sort of an addition of, additional level of abstraction on top of PDB. PDB is primarily a library designed to read and write uh, data structures that you would see in a C or C++ application. You know, it reads and writes, uh, you know, linked lists or arrays or structs. That's what PDB is designed to do. And Silo adds an additional level of abstraction on top of that that's specific to scientific computing uh, meshes and variables to find on those meshes. So when you say meshes, are you talking structured data or unstructured data or all kinds. both? All kinds. Okay. All so kinds. Silo, Silo supports structured, unstructured, gridless meshes. It supports uh, something we call constructive solid geometry. It recently was enhanced to support AMR. Um, it, as far as I know, it supports the widest variety of scientific computing meshes of any of the I.O. libraries I'm familiar with. Okay, and what kind of applications? You said, you know, scientific computing, but could you give us some specific examples of applications that are using it and, and, and how they're using Silo? Or sure. Uh, a well known you've got of that. A uh, well, well-known application um, at Livermore Labs is AL3D. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, an arbitrary Lagrange Eulerian uh, simulation, and uh, they use that for all sorts of types of uh, simulations. What You know, you, you could, um, you know, if you wanted to drop a, drop some structure, some small object that you're using to transport things around and, and understand the impact if it was dropped off of its, uh, you know, carrying apparatus or whatever. You can use AL3D to simulate uh, simulate that and analyze it. Um, uh, let's see, there's uh, just a number of different simulations, and they're not just within B Division now. It, it turns out that the engineering department at, at Livermore Labs uses Silo uh, a number of other since since Silo was relatively successful within B division is branched out and used by you know a number of different simulations codes whether they're structural dynamics um, um, I, it'd be hard to list all the different applications it's used for but there's quite a number just within Livermore Labs and then external to the labs it's used in a number of different places uh, often visit is the uh, the trigger for using Silo for someone that's new to new to this whole world. They find visit, they want to use it, and they hear about Silo and say, "Oh, well, let's use Silo to store our data." I know okay, I didn't and, give you a complete answer there, but um, oh no, but, that's great, that's great. Let me let me dive down a little bit and ask a little a little deeper uh, technical question here. So, uh, the API that you export, uh, assumedly you have some kind of handle that represents a data structure, and you can read and write to that. But what is and please correct me if I'm wrong on that one, but follow on to that is how do you actually get the data in the program? Do you what language bindings do you export and, and what kind of is the flavor of, you know, reading and writing the data while it's still in RAM in your managed data structures? Right. Uh, so the bind the answer to the binding question is Silo supports uh, basically a C interface and a Fortran interface. Uh, a number of people who use Silo and have used it for many years would like to see a very a natural uh, C++ interface added to Silo, and, and we may do that eventually. But uh, but right now, just seeing Fortran. Um, and uh, what you get uh, the, fir the the most important handle object, you know, thingy that you need to have in a Silo uh, client is the uh, file handle. So you do a, a db open or a db create, and the result of that call is you get a file handle. 
and then with that file handle, then you basically do put and get calls on it. So you would do a DB put uh, UCD mesh for an unstructured cell data mesh. And the arguments to that call would be the three floating point arrays, uh, double or single precision or whatever you have, representing the coordinates uh, at the nodes of the mesh and um, some additional information in that call. They're just sort of a set of arguments that you're going to pass that call. And then an, another call, a, a uh, sort of sister call to that, is a DB put zone list call, which then writes out the connectivity of that mesh, you know, in for standard unstructured zoo data like uh, hexes, tets, pyramids, and wedges. You write out the connectivity with that information. And so with those two calls, you will have, uh, from the client, you will have passed a set of arguments representing either the coordinates or the connectivity, and those get shoved out in the silo file. And then later on, you can, you can either close that file, hand that to another application, they can open it up and, and read that data back out of it. And on the read end of things, what you get back are, are not individual, not the same arguments that you wrote in the right half. You get structs back. Every read call results in some uber struct representing all little tidbits of information associated with that object. So this file format, it really is more of a format. Than, um, you can do all sorts of... It's, it's it's much more specific. It doesn't seem like HDF5 or these other things where you can pretty much well, write blocks of values. Right. Um, it is specific to the the um, job of reading and writing uh, mesh and field data. Um, it does have, it actually does have a lower level uh, interface. It's just the raw data interface. And this sort of gets at the issue of data shareability and interoperability. Uh, HDF5, you're right, <clears throat> that supports basically reading and writing, you know, arrays and structs or arrays of structs. It's, it's a very freeform sort of um, format and interface. But uh, if I were to store an unstructured mesh to an HDF5 file <clears throat> and not give you uh, any of the details on how I did that, it would maybe rather difficult for you to use the HDF interface alone and identify, for example, which arrays in there represent coordinate arrays, which arrays might represent the connectivities, or if you had arbitrary polyhedral, for example, silo supports, this is a, another mesh type, is a completely arbitrary polyhedral mesh. Um, it might be rather difficult for you to use the uh, HDF interface alone to understand that data. So the value of the silo <coughs> interface, excuse me, my throat's a little dry, I'm gonna have to probably get a glass of water here in a minute. Um, but the value of the silo interface is it adds the, uh, the meaning and semantics necessary to understand that data in terms of meshes and fields. And in fact, silo not only writes PDB files, it does write HDF5 files. So, um, but if, if you look at an HDF5 file that's written by silo, I, I guarantee it will not be that easy to understand what's there. That It's the silo semantics on top of it that gives you an understanding of that meaning. Okay, so in comparison then, Silo HDF5, I mean, would you consider HDF5 a competitor or is it something with, uh, you know, a, just a different software package with a different emphasis or, you know, how would you characterize the differences between these two? Uh, I, I, would not, <clears throat> I would not characterize HDF5 as a competitor to Silo. Um, um, HDF, Silo uses HDF5 and, and in fact we're very very happy to have HDF5 uh, underneath Silo and there are several reasons for that I'll give one example uh, a couple of years ago uh, at Livermore Labs when we there was a file system we were installing on the purple machine at the time and uh, there were a number of number of problems with getting that si file system to work correctly and we were having issues with uh, as users were using for example visit uh, data was coming back, uh, reads were failing, but there was no indication that we were getting read failures. And you would find that you, you know, you'd get data all the way to somebody's screen and it would look a little different. It wouldn't necessarily be obvious that it was bad to a user. And this is, this is a very bad situation. So they wanted to add checksumming, application level checksumming. And since a number, number of our applications actually use Silo, within a couple of days, I took advantage of HDF5's uh, checksum capability within the Silo library itself so that applications using Silo could turn on this feature, and now all their data would be checksummed. So if a read did fail, they'd know about it immediately. And um, that turned out very to cool. be very useful and very important. And, and so HDF5 is very useful for us for that reason. Oh, yay, middleware. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's it's not a competitor uh, because it really doesn't operate at the same level of abstraction. 
Now, I think the HDF5 group does support a high-level HL, is the, I think the name of the interface, on top of HDF5 to do some of the kinds of things that Silo does. And so you might consider that it sort of looks like a competitor. I don't know. I actually haven't used the HL interface to HDF5, so I, I really couldn't say what it could do, but I, I know that it exists. So, Mark, how many developers are there for Silo? You, you said you're in charge of features and maintenance and things like that. Are there others? Is there a community? How, how does that work? Well, uh, for for a long time, Silo was uh, in a clear case repository um, and not really accessible um, to a num any other developers. Now we've moved it recently to an SVN repo, and because of that, it's been more easy to get other developers working on it. Uh, but for the most part, I have, um, certainly in the last year and a half to two years, I and Kathleen Bonnell, uh, a visit developer, have been the only ones that have been doing real earnest development on Silo. Um, and uh, I do often get feature requests, pa occasionally patches from, you know, users at large, either within Livermore or outside of Livermore. And for the most part, try to respond to those when I can. Uh, but over the years, since, you know, first started development on it, I think, you know, close to 18 different developers, many of them also to visit developers, have contributed to Silo in one way or another. It's cool. not it's, and it's not available, I'm sorry, it's not available, for example, for SVN Anonymous Checkout for people to do uh, work on yet. I don't know if that's uh, going to be necessary for Silo's um, continued life, but but certainly we do respond even to the, um, you know, general user community when there are issues with it. Okay, great. So you mentioned that you have C and Fortran bindings for Silo, um, but what language is it actually written in? Well, it's, it's uh, written in C, um, but recently uh, Peter Lindstrom uh, developed some, he's a developer, a researcher at Livermore Labs who's done a lot of compression work. And he developed some really cool uh, compression capabilities that we added to Silo recently, and those are actually in C++. So within the last year and a half, we actually added C++ code to Silo for this reason. Uh, it can be compiled or configured without it. Since we use GNU Autocomp for Silo, you can configure without C++ in it. Uh, but if you do, then ultimately you need to use a C++ uh, linker to link it all together. Um, but it's, it's predominantly written in, in C. Cool. Let me actually ask you about the compression thing because this is a topic that comes up uh, in the MPI world quite a bit too. We should you know, people say, "Oh, use compression on the network, and you can, you know, right. uh, reduce your latency and increase your band, your effective bandwidth, and things like that." Can you tell me what your experiences are with uh, with compression? You know, when's it good? When's it not good? Or is it always good? Yeah. Well. Uh... I can give you I can give you anecdotal evidence to, or uh, experience with it. I, I actually have not used uh, a lot of compression features in quote real applications. So we have test uh, test data to ensure that uh, Silo's compression features are in fact working correctly and doing what we'd expect them to do. But uh, experience with real world applications, at least for me, is is pretty limited. <clears throat> I do know that uh, you know a lot of these applications. Uh, for their initial time zero uh, sort of restart files when you're talking about the very, you know, setting up the problem and getting it ready to run, uh, those com those files compress very well, and there's a good reason for that. There's a lot of zeros in them. You know, there, you know, there may be a uh, 100 different field variables that they're going to model on a mesh, but initially many of those uh, are very smooth, smoothly varying. And as time goes on, these things, you know, if there's, if there's mixing and material advection and all sorts of other interesting stuff going on, the, the data can get very uh, sort of noisy, and then the compression algorithms don't work nearly as well. So to, compression tends to be better at early time than it is at late time. Uh, we tend, obviously, we can compress integer data much, much better than we can compress floating point data. Uh, this is true of, of compression algorithms in general, not just silos compression algorithms. But uh, but we take advantage of compression at two levels. We can use whatever's available in HDF5. And then, as I mentioned, uh, Peter Lindstrom, a researcher at Livermore, gave us some additional compression features, which we added to Silo. And those operated at a different level of abstraction. And, and, and the higher abstraction they operate at, the generally the better they can compress. So, for example, an algorithm that is actually aware of a mesh, for example, is going to do a better job compressing data on that mesh than an algorithm that's basically just thinking of it in terms of a 1D array of floats or, or integers.
So, uh, so Peter's algorithms do better than what we could do at the HDF5 level um, it, with our test data. I don't actually, I can't actually say how well his algorithms are performed on our applications in general. He's got excellent results on stuff that he's done with the same algorithms. He's published them widely. So I, I, I don't know them in detail, but they're available in the literature. So you say you use HDF5 internally. Um, it, is in the end everything on disk actually a HDF5 file with a silo extra sauce on top? Or do you only yes, use it for some parts? Is it optional? No. Um, well, when you, when you create a silo file, you have a choice of which, uh, quote, driver you're going to use. And there are two underlying drivers that it, it can write to. A PDB file, again, that's not protein database, that's portable database and an HDF5 file. Uh, in addition, if you're reading data, you can actually read some other formats through some different drivers, but that's not as relevant. So when you create a file, you identify which driver you're going to use. And uh, when you do that, then the file that you get ultimately is either a HDF file if you use that driver or a PDB file if you use the other driver. So that, that means that HDF5 tools will operate on that data just fine. Um, but you said this extra sauce, you mentioned extra sauce. Yeah, there's extra sauce in there that allows uh, silo level applications to really, like I say, understand what's there. Um, and uh, the more that I hear myself talking about it, it is rather difficult to explain what a silo file is because it can actually operate at multiple levels of abstraction. For example, in a silo file, you can actually create what you would think of as directories in a typical Unix file system. So you can create directories, uh, CD into them, write data in those directories. And, and the reason for that is it allows you to organize your data in a file in a very natural way. And, you know, keep meshes, for example, in one directory and all the variables on those meshes in another directory, if that's what you wanted to do. But that's all within, quote, one file. Of the two drivers, PDB and HDF5, is one recommended over the other? Uh, I, I generally recommend HDF5 because there are additional things that Silo supports on the HDF5 driver that are just not supportable on the PDB driver. So, uh, and, and there are other advantages. HDF5 tends to perform, um, you know, IO performance on HDF5 can be better in certain circumstances, and you just have more control even with HDF5 uh, directly. For example, when you open a Silo file, I believe you can say which of the various I.O. drivers HDF5 uses, because HDF5 can in turn use Section 2 I.O. Uh, I think it can use the, uh, it can use MPI I.O. even uh, if you're doing parallel, which we could talk about parallel. That makes things more complicated. Silo is not <clears throat> really a parallel interface, which makes it even more interesting. But you generally have more control on the HDF5 driver, and that's why I recommend using it. How hard would it be to add a, another driver? Like, say you wanted Silo on top of SQLite. Yeah, that's uh, that's problematic, and that has to do with the way the HDF, uh, or I'm sorry, way the Silo uh, is is designed. Um, I have had on the drawing boards for probably three or four years now a complete overhaul of of the Silo uh, upper level. Uh, but if you were to write another driver for Silo, the short ant the short problem is you have to do all the work. Um, that actually has been done on all the other drivers already. Uh, and so, for example, I'll give you a real simple example. If, it, if, it's, if at time, if it's an initial development, it had support for, say, structured meshes and structured variables, and you had a driver, the PDB driver, doing that, and then you added a number of things such as unstructured meshes and AMR meshes to the PDB driver, then when you came back to implement this new hypothetical driver, call it FUBAR, when you came back to implement FUBAR, you then have to go back and implement the uh, structured meshes and variables, you know, unstructured meshes and variables, and then AMR. You have to implement all those things to get it get that new driver functioning. And that has to do with the way that the silo uh, sort of underpinnings are architected. I, I re really would like to see that change, but that's sort of the, the state of affairs right now. So you mentioned parallel and its complexities, and I'm I'm a parallel guy, so of course that piqued my my interest there. Um, what what are some of the complexities? What uh, does or does not work well in parallel with Silo? Well, so Silo is a serial I/O library, 
and uh, for that reason, we do not ever compile HDF5 underneath it with uh, with HDF5's parallel features. Um, if you use Silo in a parallel application, you're going to use it as a serial library. Now, um, that might sound really, really bad, uh, and you can, of course, use it inappropriately, and uh, things can would be really, really bad. So an inappropriate would, use would be, well, uh, you know, you just do serial I.O. from a parallel application. Well, that obviously doesn't scale. Another inappropriate use would be, well, you just write a file per processor for a parallel application. That's also, in my opinion, inappropriate. Uh, so Silo is typically used in parallel in what I have referred to as, quote, poor man's parallel I.O. And in that scenario, uh, what you do is you write uh, some number of files. You decide ahead of time what that number is going to be. Uh, call it 32, 64, 128. And this is independent of the number of processors you're running on. And uh, what you do then with that number, call that n, is the the application only has n silo files open at any one time, and it divides the processors that it's using into n groups. And within a group, only one processor in that group actually has a silo file open, and it's it's reading or writing data into it. And then across groups, you're getting concurrent parallel I/O. So uh, this is a way of of not doing a file per processor. Getting it, it turns out it scales very well. We've scaled this up to. Gee, I don't know. I want to say 65,000 processors so far, and it seems to behave okay on like 256 files. Um, that's in a nutshell what poor man's parallel I.O. is. There are other aspects to it if you wanted to get into that really make it work well, but that's what it's doing. So if you did want to use, say, you know, HDF5's parallel I.O. directly and you know, multiple processors to a single file, would that require a major rewrite of Silo, or is that something that's coming, or something that's not planned, or you don't want to do it, or what's what's the state well, of see. doing something like that? Um, it's not planned. It's not something I, uh, given HDF5's current parallel interface, it's not necessarily something I'd want to do either. Um, so, uh, so, and in fact, you couldn't really do that um, with uh, with Silo right now. The only the only use of HDF5 that you can get with Silo. Uh, is a serial HDF5. Um, I have used HDF5 directly from applications to do, you know, use their MPIO interface and do collective parallel reads and writes. The the difficulty that I ran into in the cases that I've tried to apply that is our, um, we're, we're talking about multi-physics simulations that do just a wide variety of things. So the, the size and shape and existence even of data from processor to processor in these applications is uh, highly variable. And the I.O. patterns that result are, are very difficult to stuff through a collective interface, a collective I.O. interface. And poor man's parallel basically allows us to sort of sidestep that issue and still provide a lot of flexibility and fluidity in IO patterns from processor to processor. So say I had a UCD mesh and I wanted to use HDF5's parallel IO. Is, would there, is it documented such that I could write an HDF5 file thus that I could use Silo to kind of read it, almost describe the format for me? Right. Um, there is no documentation on that, really. Um, and if let me let me make sure I understand you. Um, I don't. It, the paraphrase would be: I'm an application. I want to write direct to HDF5, but I want the resulting file to quote look like a Silo file, look like an HDF5 file that Silo would have produced. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So then I could put it into Visit or something and not have to make my own custom driver. Right. Uh, yeah, there's. I, I would not ever really recommend that um, for a. You know, the the biggest the biggest reason for this is that the HDF5 driver, when it was developed for Silo, was developed with one very specific intention in mind, and and I'm not sure really why this route was taken at the time. Um, strangely enough, I was somewhat involved in it, but didn't really understand what was going on in detail at the time. But the HDF5 driver is in fact designed to hide a lot of what's going on in HDF5 from the silo client. And as a result of that, when you look at an HDF5 file that's produced by silo, it looks much more 
uh, foreign and unnative to HDF5 than it really ought to. Uh, and so trying to do the reverse and sort of create an HDF5 file that looks like silo is, is very difficult. I would, not, I would not even attempt doing that. So moving towards something like performance, what kind of performance are we seeing for Silo? Is there a significant overhead for going through all these levels of abstraction through HDF5, through Silo, or are we getting pretty close to native disk speed? Well, um, you know, that's, that's a good question that I have not looked at in many years. That is my first task when I worked at Livermore Labs was to look at this issue in detail. And, uh, and at the time, um, with uh, other drivers that we were using, we were seeing some, depending on the kinds of uh, calls we we're making, whether it's a DB put UCD mesh, which is a call to write a unstructured cell data mesh, or DB put uh, quad var, which is a call to write a, a structured a variable on a structured mesh. You know, depending on the kinds of operations going on in silo, we could see uh, not such great performance uh, at the underlying I.O. system, the actual bandwidth to disk. <clears throat> In addition to that, uh, we were, you know, Livermore was heavily into craze at the time, but we wouldn't do our viz on the craze. We'd do our viz on, on other systems. And so you have this problem where you had cray floating point data, but you're trying to read it on, on a different CPU architecture. And so there, there were uh, numeric conversion operations going on to actually support that. And those numeric conversions were a rate-limiting factor in doing the I.O. So you'd read the data off disk, do, do the numeric conversion, you finally can hand it back off to the client. Um, HDF5, in fact, performs that job very rapidly. It's, it's generally, HDF5 is generally better than uh, disk I.O. So the numeric conversions that it does, if it does any, are, are faster and therefore hidden in the disk, disk uh, bandwidth. And so recently, I haven't looked at this issue. I, I, I certainly should, but none of my customers have been complaining about it, and so I haven't actually looked at the issue of performance in detail. But I've, I've got to believe that for a lot of the large data that we read and write, the overhead of silo is relatively small. Now, now there's, there's a flip side of that. If, if the overhead to silo is not small, if that argument's not true, then you push silo out of the way and uh, try to read and write to a lower level interface, maybe direct to HDF5. Well, the effect of that is now you've taken all the data that you were making accessible to Silo and all the tools that support Silo and said, I'm not going to do that anymore. So you pay a price. If it, your data is less shareable and there may be less tools available to you or the tools that you want simply won't be available to you. So, so the real win here is, is abstraction then, and, and the performance is probably generally assumed is kind of what I'm hearing you say, right? Certainly. Uh, uh, I'm ashamed to say this, but certainly it is assumed um, in, in the latter years of silo development. I, I am certain that there are issues in there that we could improve substantially, but, it, but it, it performance is assumed. And the reason it's assumed is ge people are generally happy with what they can do with silo data. Well, they're happy enough with what they can do with silo data once they've produced it, that the cost of using silo is not generally a concern. I don't sure, know if that, that answer makes, makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense, actually. Let me go off in a, in a slightly other direction here. Um, how big can a silo file be? Is there anything restrictive in your meta format, or are you really tied more by, by the underlying drivers? Uh, I am totally tied by the underlying drivers. So uh, if you've configured HDF5 correctly, you get Linux large file support wherever you are, well, then that file can be, you know, as big as you can store, you know, 64-bit, you know, 2 to the 64 uh, bytes, which, of course, the, the biggest silo files I've heard of have been on the order of maybe 10 to 15 gigabytes on the HDF5 driver. Uh, the PDB driver, um, well, let's see, Hank had some experience with uh, PDB driver on the Ranger machine where he went up above 2 gigabytes. Uh, I don't know what that was. He might have gone up to 4 gigabytes per file on some studies he did on Ranger scalability studies back in June of this year. Uh, but, but generally, you know, there, there isn't going to be a limit as long as the underlying file system supports it. So let me ask this then. You, you mentioned earlier that, you know, you can kind of have a, a file containing files, so to speak, that you can have directories and CD and read and write into them and things like that. When you talk about these big files that you're talking about, is that, you know, one mesh or is it generally, you know, a, a couple of meshes and, the, you know, the application dumped all of their output there or right. how does that go? Well, uh, that would typically be um, – so um, – 
conceptually, it's a single mesh. You know, if you're running on 65,000 CPUs, you may, you may have one application that's got a mesh that's decomposed over 65,000 CPUs. So you write the bits and pieces of that mesh to different silo files. And so within one, say, a 10 gigabyte silo file, you may decide to write a thousand mesh pieces to that file. And, and typically the way you do that is you create a subdirectory within the silo file for each mesh piece. And all the data associated with that piece goes into that subdirectory. Uh, this is part of using silo in what I call, call this poor man's parallel I.O. sort of way. Uh, but, but, but typically, um, now you can store completely unrelated and different meshes in a silo file. We do that pretty routinely for test data all the time. Uh, but typically, when you're looking at these really, really big data sets, you're looking at one monolithic mesh that has been decomposed into pieces. And then the silo, each silo file is managing some of the pieces of that large mesh. Uh, maybe the entire thing on 65,000 CPUs might be broken up into 256 different silo files. So we talked about these files and they store meshes and scientific data. Uh, what's the strangest thing you've ever seen somebody put inside a silo file? You know, I um, I was you know wondering that over the weekend, and I, I really don't have a a good answer to that. I. Um, yeah, I don't. I I can't think of the quote strangest thing that we've done with it. I I do know that you know people can look at the silo interface and and make the the following mistake. They can sort of use, they can read and write objects like meshes and variables using you know db put ucd var or db get ucd var, or they can use this lower level function called db read and db write, which is basically reads and writes raw data arrays. And it's not necessarily clear to the novice silo user that if you use those functions in silo, your data is not shareable. There's nothing that Visit can do with that data. There's nothing that um, any other high level tool can really do with that data because all it sees it as is an arbitrary, uh, you know, bytes. So maybe the strangest thing is this, this this issue of understanding the level of abstraction at which your data is characterized and its impact on your ability to use uh, other tools on it. Um, I think a lot of people stumble over that issue when they're first trying to approach these file formats like Silo or Exodus or NetCDF or whatever. So you mentioned throughout this interview here you know, a couple things that you'd like to work on like you know redoing the top layer and things like that but what are some things that that are coming out that you know you you have had the time and the cycles and new features and people ask for and things like that what, what's coming out in the new versions of silo well the the biggest um the biggest newest thing is probably support for adaptive mesh refinement data in a silo file uh that's structured amr um and really what's necessary there is to understand that different pieces of mesh are nesting within uh, other pieces of mesh and to understand roughly, you know, the logical extents of those, those nestings and the, uh, the refinement ratios. For example, you know, in a typical 2D case, you might take a parent mesh and decompose it into four quads and child, child mesh piece. Uh, so that would be a re refinement ratio of 2 and X and 2 and Y in a simple 2D case. So what's been added to Silo is support for that knowledge about uh, AMR data. And um, so here's a, here's a swizzle to this. Once that gets added to the Silo library itself, and that was recently added, so the 4.7 release about, uh, I guess, about six months ago or whatever uh, included this capability. Um, People then write, start start exploiting that capability, and then they turn around and use Visit, and some of them get frustrated because, well, it's not working. And the problem is, okay, well, now we have a separate set of issues that we need to go to Visit and work on the Visit Silo plugin to support that new feature in Silo. And so I often, often get this double whammy of making the enhancement to Silo and then going into Visit and having to make the enhancement to the Silo plugin so that it will read this new feature in Silo. <laughs> well, um, there you go. Okay. Or, or people get frustrated that it's not there yet. Um, and uh, but but anyhow, the uh, the newest things are adaptive mesh refinement. I've I've added uh, real real simple things for uh, bug fixes recently um, for what we call species data in Silo. Um, I, I would say there's nothing profound planned. Um, bug fix releases, enhancements, e even even major ones if they're requested are going to fall into my lap, and I, I will do them as they are made by the various funding agencies, typically my program, programmatic uh, users, who need that work done. 
this large re-architecture effort I mentioned, I've, I've pestered my group leader about on several occasions, and we both agreed that, well, yeah, it would be great to do that, but no one's asking for that right now, and we have way more other work to do. Okay, so what's the license that a silo is under, and who can use it? Uh, let's see. Anybody can use it. Um, the actual license... Gosh, I should know this. I, I've looked at it at one point, and, and I don't have my notes handy, and I'd have to go look through an email <laughs> history to really Is it terrible it that software engineers basically have to have a little part of lawyer in them <laughs> just well, to get their I, job done? It is. I, I'm, I'm, geez, I'm just, I'm just ashamed that I don't actually know the answer to that question. In fact, yeah, I think you probably uh, let me know that you're going to ask that before, and I neglected to look that information out. It's either a BSD uh, a license or a GNU. And if it's not GNU, I think my group leader wanted us to relicense it under GNU sometime soon. So um, I know that there are a couple of users of Silo, for example, TechX, that would like to see it, uh, see a GNU license for it. Um, um, but anyhow, I, I don't know the specific one, and I think we are moving to a GNU license for it, a GPL. Okay. So you can just download it free from the Silo website? You can, yes. And that website is? Oh, I'm sorry. It's silo.llnl.gov. Okay, and I noticed there's a nice manual there too, and a nice PDF manual on how to use it. Right. And there are, one of the other things, often I learn to use software by seeing examples of its use. So the uh, there's a page there on examples, and it shows a number of different mesh types, um, pictures of them from visit, and then a little bit of verbiage on what's being uh, uh, illustrated by the example. And then you can download the source code for the example and the data files, which are often useful in, in trying to understand really what's there and why it's structured the way it is. Mark, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up here. This show will be up on our website at rce-cast.com, and there's a iTunes subscribe and RSS feed, and you can always download the MP3 files there. Also, there's a nomination form where if anybody wants to hear any topics that we're not aware of, go ahead and fill out the form and let us know about it, and we will check it out soon. Well, thanks so much for having me. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. And again, Jeff and I will both be at SC this year. I believe it's in Portland, right? Oh, man, I need plane tickets. Portland, Oregon, yes. I need plane tickets. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll both be in Portland and... Hopefully we'll see all of you there.